The Lord be with you. As my son so graciously shared with you, my ears aren't working. It's really just this one, and I'm very glad this one is. Thank you so much, uh, Bethany. Let them know that we're loved, that there was not a more encapsulated version of the gospel. I don't know what it is. Thank you. And thank you, Michelle, for filling in, for pinch hitting this morning. I like when our roster is that deep that we can go in. Thank you so much. And I, I wanted to say, as you're turning in your Bibles to Mark chapter 6, uh, I thought about this as, as Bob and Bethany were singing, that that was an encapsulation of what we've seen this morning. Uh, it's not just people in the same generation who stand in this pulpit and do stuff. You ever notice that? Do you know how blessed we are as a church that people who, of all ages, stand here and, and read Scripture and pray and sing and even preach and proclaim? We're blessed in that way. I hope you know that. I hope you recognize that and I hope you're thankful and encouraging others in that. Mark chapter 6, beginning with verse 1, we'll read through verse 13. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hand? Is not this the carpenter? Son of Mary, brother of James and Jose and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deeds of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, Shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Now, O oh God... Help us to hear what you would have us to hear, to do what you call us to do, so that we may be who you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> in his final novel, published after his death in 1940, Thomas Wolfe wrote these words. You can't go back home. You can't go back home to your family, back home to your childhood, back home to romantic love, back home to a young man's dreams of glory and of fame, back home to exile, to escape to Europe and some foreign land, back home to lyricism, to singing just for singing's sake, back home to asceticism, to one's youthful idea of the artist and the all-sufficiency of art and beauty and love. Back home to the ivory tower. Back home to places in the country. To the cottage in Bermuda. Away from all the strife and conflict of the world. Back home to the father you have lost and have been looking for. Back home to someone who can help you, save you, ease the burden for you. Back home to the old forms and systems of things which once seemed everlasting, but which are changing all the time. He said, you can't go back home to the escapes of time and memory. Wolf was right, you know. You can't go home again. Anyone who has spent any measurable amount of his or her life away from home knows that's true. 
You can't go home again. Because home isn't the same. Whatever you think home is, it isn't once you return. Sure, there are those obvious differences. Do you know they built a Target across town? Yeah, yeah, built a Target. Rawls Warehouse down to get closed, not there anymore. Lowe's put them out of business. But it's the subtle shifts over time that carry our ideal of home away from us. Like the young soldier who returns home from war to find his high school sweetheart, the girl whose picture he's been carrying for 24 months, is engaged to a boy she met in college. Or the woman who returns home after passing the bar to practice law only to find that her family keeps their distance because she's the first one with something more than a high school diploma. Or the missionary who's at home on furlough and can't get comfortable with the rapidly increasing consumerism of online shopping and in-store pickup. Or the man who's paid his debt to society and struggles with his renewed freedom because he's not really sure what to do in a world where his mama's dead and his sister moved out of state. You just can't go home again. Life, like the time we use to measure and record it, just marches on. It's always moving forward. They don't push pause back home when you leave. Things change, and whenever we find our feet on the familiar ground of home, we realize we aren't quite where we thought we once were. Because you can't go home again. Thomas Wolfe was right. Thomas Wolfe knew that. But after reading this passage this morning, did Jesus know that? I mean, Mark tells us Jesus tried to go back home. It says it in the very first text, very first verse. He left that place. He had been at the house of Jairus, a, a leader in the synagogue in the Decapolis. And now he's come back home to his hometown of Nazareth. Why? I wonder what compelled Jesus to come back home. What compels any of us to come back home? Maybe Jesus missed the smell of Mary's cornbread cooking for supper. Maybe he wanted to check in on an old friend from school whom he was worried about. Or maybe, perhaps Jesus wanted to subtly walk by that shop, that shop where that girl worked. That girl who turned down his promposal. He wanted to just walk by that shop, big crowd of folks behind him, just sort of wink at her as he walked by. See, look what you missed out on. I'm a big deal. Maybe. Or maybe he just wanted to catch up on the latest news in town. How the big time developer from Rome was going to build a golf course out on Lake Galilee. Call it the Galilean Golf Club. How they were going to close down the docks because the posts were rotten and the, the boards were warped and it was hazardous now to even go out there. Maybe Jesus just wanted to come back home because home was where he had hoped to rest, to recharge, to find some sense of acceptance and belonging without folks lining up to have their toothaches and tumors healed and their palms red. Maybe Jesus had hoped that it would all just pause for a moment when he came home, that he'd get to just be Jesus, little Joshua, Mary's boy, without all the weight of the expectations that came with being the rumored Messiah. Maybe. <coughs> but I don't necessarily think that's true myself. No, I don't think Jesus came home to take a break. Because I'll tell you, after being gone for a week, home sometimes is the last place you go when you want to get away from things. Because what's waiting on you at home? Knee-high grass, a bathroom floor that needs to be mopped, air in, an empty refrigerator. you got to go to the grocery store. There's not rest waiting at home. When it's all piled on, when the pressure mounts, you want to get away from that sort of thing. Maybe go down to the coast, go up in the mountains. You don't go home for a break, especially when there's a crowd following you. No, I think Jesus went home for the same reason so many of us who've had our vistas stretched, our minds broadened, our horizons expanded. Jesus went home for the same reason so many of us do. Because he had experienced something. 
He had a word for those back home. It's like somebody who grew up in a town that just had a Chili's and only ate fajitas there and then went out of state, went out of town, went to the little Mexican joint called Juan's Fajitas somewhere, and it blew his mind. He came home. What are y'all eating? These aren't fajitas. They're more than this. The same thing. Your minds, your horizons, your, your vistas are expanded, and so you come home because you want to tell somebody. Jesus had a word. Perhaps he came home because he knew those folks and he knew they needed to hear what he had to say too. To hear about the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. Unfortunately, it can be hard to talk to folks you know. Especially if what you have to say challenges something they've held as sacred, something they believe to be unbreakable, something they believe to be true. And they've held on to it for so long. Like the time I came home for Thanksgiving, sitting next to one of my family members who I'd been close to for most of my life, when I heard her say one of the most racist things I've ever heard anyone say in my life. If she had been a total stranger, I'd have called her out on the carpet right there. I'd have said, are you ignorant? Are you dumb? I'd have said some other stuff I can't say in church, probably. I'd have called her out right there. But it was hard. Hard to tell her how horribly wrong she was. Hard to think that I was somehow related to someone who could say something so awful. Hard to realize not only that, but that so many people at that table would agree with her. And any rebuke from me would have been brushed off as some influence from living up there in the big city and all that book learning. It's hard to talk to folks you know when you've got something to say that they don't like to hear. Because we don't like to hurt people's feelings. We don't like to step on toes. We'd rather leave well enough alone and keep our disagreements to ourselves because, after all, we got to live with these folks. we got to live with them. we got to see them every Sunday at church. we got to see them every third Saturday at Mama's house for lunch. we got to see them every morning with our coffee across the breakfast table. I'm sure it was hard for Jesus to come back to Nazareth and on the Sabbath teach in the synagogue. And I bet, just as Mark said, there were many who heard him who were astounded because Jesus no doubt had a word that would disrupt their expectations, a word that would go against the grain of what they had all believed up to that point, a new word. He walked right into that synagogue on the Sabbath and began to teach. And I can imagine it was hard to talk to folks he already knew. To look out and see faces that were so familiar. But there is a harder thing to do. Sure, it's hard to talk to folks you know. But it's even harder to talk to folks who know you. I remember the first time I ran into someone from high school after coming home from college, after answering God's call to ministry. I was in the Walmart and Enterprise because, frankly, that's all there was to do back in those days was walk around the Walmart and Enterprise. When I ran into Kanye and Terrence, or Kenye and Terrence, I think he changed the pronunciation once Kanye West became a thing. I grew up with Kenye and Terrence. I'd gone to school with them since elementary school. I'd worked with Terrence in the summers, even lived in the same neighborhood with both of them until I was in the ninth grade. They said, hey, man, we had not seen you around the hood. What's going on? How's it been going? What's, what's up? We haven't seen you in, feels like, forever. Then I told them, well, I, I, I'm up in Birmingham. I'm studying religion. Plan on being a minister. There was a pause. And then laughter. You? What are you going to do, anoint people with chicken grease? You? You a minister? No. When I assured them that I wasn't joking, our conversation got a whole lot more awkward and a whole lot shorter than it would have been otherwise. It's hard to talk to folks who know you when you have something new to say. 
something transformative, something prophetic and provocative. That's why it doesn't surprise me in the slightest that Mark tells us many who had heard Jesus were astounded. They said, where did he get all this? What's this wisdom he's got? Look at the deeds of power he's done. Ain't that the carpenter? Isn't that Mary's boy? Brother James, Jose, Judas, and Simon, and then his sisters? And then Mark says, did you t- did you, it's just a brief sentence. Did you see it? Then Mark says, and they took offense at him. Some translations say, and he, they stumbled on account of him. Of course they did. This is Mary's boy, which, by the way, is a backhanded way of pointing out the rumors of his illegitimacy, because you know they didn't buy it in Nazareth. You know they didn't buy the whole, yeah, Mary got pregnant by God, sure, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah, that really happened. No. That's Mary's boy. That's the carpenter who fixed the rotted deck post. That's the one who built the bookshelves we got up in the study, built the bed in the boy's bedroom. Where does he get off telling us? Where does he get off telling these fine folks in, in Nazareth about the kingdom of God? They raised him. They raised Jesus. Where does he get off telling them? I mean, can't you hear? Can't you just hear some old woman in the back of the synagogue standing up after Jesus said something about giving their money to the poor, welcoming the stranger, forgiving their enemies? Can't you just hear her saying, now, Jesus, just hold on. Who do you think you are? I changed your diapers while your mama was chasing Jose around. Don't you give me any lip about what's right and wrong in the kingdom of God. Can't you? I can can't you just hear a couple of the men, three or four pews back, mumbling to themselves, you know, you know, his mama raised him better than this. If his daddy was still alive, he wouldn't be saying all this nonsense. I can hear it. Oh, yeah. It's hard to say a word to folks who know you because they got too much dirt on you, too much leverage against you. They think they got you figured out before your words leave your lips. And they can come up with any way to unravel anything you got to say. Jesus, well, we know, you know, he was always a bit strange. Didn't have a daddy around. Mama said he was born. He's a, he's a sweet boy, but he's a little different. Right? I have no doubt. That's why Jesus had to say to them, prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. We know his mama and his brothers and sisters thought he was crazy. Mark tells us too. They come and want to bind him up and haul him off to what we used to call the loony bin, I guess. But who can talk to their kinfolk about hard things and not come away at least a little hurt or ignored? Of course, for Jesus, the stakes were higher than just disagreements about politics or parental philosophies over dinner. For Jesus, this was about the kingdom of God and its inbreaking power for the present time at hand. And the response from those who knew him, well, it only left a void. I mean, Mark says he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people, cured them, and he was amazed at their unbelief. I don't think it was Jesus' lack of power that resulted in an inability to do deeds of power. No, I think it had more to do with their blind assurance that they hadn't figured out and that nothing he could say or do would be able to penetrate their thick shell of preconceived notions about who Jesus was. And so I can't say that I'm too surprised that Jesus then went about among the villages teaching that he told the disciples, all right, boys, let's get up and go. And he gave them instructions about going out and shaking the dust from their feet whenever they were refused. No, I I can't say that I'm too surprised about Jesus' reaction to his hometown rejection would be to carry on, to take the good news out into places where they didn't know him, where they hadn't heard all his childhood stories, places where his name wasn't on the trophies in the trophy case in the high school, places where folks would, would have to ask, now, Where is Nazareth? Is that down around Montgomery? I got some friends, some folks in Prattville. Is that where it is? No. I'm not surprised a bit that Jesus carried on 
and shook the dust of his hometown from his own sandals because it's hard to talk to folks you know and even harder to talk to folks who know you. But can I tell you something? It's necessary. It's necessary because some folks never leave home. Some folks never leave the quiet comfort of their own made-up minds. Some folks never stray too far from the driveway because out there, out there, the world might be different. And those folks out there might not think the way we think. And those folks out there might not believe the things we believe. And we might get awful uncomfortable around those kind of folks out there. So there are some people who never leave their physical, spiritual, or mental home who never allow the Spirit of God to stretch their horizons and allow them to see beyond the blinders they've constructed. There's some people who need us, those of us who have allowed the calling of God to lead us into strange places, into unexpected relationships, into new spaces and new realities. God needs us to call the ones we know and the ones who know us into the deeper reality of God's love and into the hard work of God's inbreaking kingdom. God needs us to go home and tell our friends, tell our family there that the kingdom of God is so much bigger than they could ever imagine. So much bigger than we could imagine. God needs us to tell them what Bob, that we're loved. But it'll be hard. Because the work of proclaiming God's kingdom is hard. It'll be hard all the more because proclaiming God's kingdom to the ones we know and the ones who know us and the ones who think they already know it all is hard. It was hard for Jesus. Why would we expect it to be different for us? Just outside those doors... Maybe inside those doors are folks who need to hear that they are loved. To hear about the good news of God's kingdom. They need to hear about God's love for them and they need to hear about God's love for everybody else too. And yours may be the voice. Yours may be the voice they want They don't want to hear when it comes to the truth of God's kingdom. Yours is the voice that they may brush aside and brush off because they think they know you. They think they've got you figured out. But yours is the voice, the life, the heart, the hands and feet that God just might use to change their world. It's hard to be a prophet among friends. But maybe, maybe it's just what God is calling you to this morning. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, Lord, we've seen just how hard it was for you to go back home. How hard it was for you, Lord, to sit at the table with friends and family, to stand in the synagogue and tell them the truth. So, Lord, we know it'll be hard for us. But Lord, we pray for strength. We pray for courage that can only come from the knowledge that we are loved from that love realized and lived out in our lives. So God, if you're calling us this morning, make it known to us, to everyone who's here. Speak to our hearts. Give us, Lord, the dependence on you to move as you would have us to move. Respond as you would have us respond. In Christ's name we pray.
Amen.